coming up on the programme. Find out why flower bouquets are dotted around Cambridge. Cambridge United fans reflect on the recent season. And we learn more about ambitious plans to conserve local nature. Hello, I'm Katura Sestine. You're watching Cambridge Rolling News. Welcome to the programme. If you've been out in Cambridge over the past week, you may have noticed some bouquets lying around. This is because one group of flower enthusiasts left arrangements dotted in and around the city to remind people they are not alone. I went to meet some of the people behind the petals. Flower clubs from across the county took part in Lonely Bouquet Day last week as part of a nationwide event to make strangers happy. The event, which is held annually, aims to reach out to people in times of loneliness. People are walking along the street and they see this little posy with a, a tag on it and saying that, um, explaining it's a lonely bouquet and they'd like to be, the posy would like to be taken home and enjoyed. And people think, well, that's very different. Uh, and it does bring a smile to people's faces, really. Sheila was first introduced to flower arranging by a friend and she feels flowers opened up a whole new world for her. I've done things that I didn't think I'd do. Um, I've met people, so many lovely people and none of that would have happened if that very good friend of mine hadn't introduced me and taken me along to an open meeting all those years ago really. I think you lose yourself in it and if you've got a problem, uh, the problem is just put on the side for a while and you can just enjoy the flowers. But what exactly is the power of a flower? I think it's the variety. Um, the fact that they're, um, you know, they grow, they're, 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 so, they're a, natural, a natural thing, they're all around us. Anybody can enjoy them, anybody can um, grow a flower if you've not got a very big garden. You can grow things in pots or window boxes. Um, you know, they, they, they don't cost a lot and um, I mean they're beautiful aren't they? They're just beautiful. All of the bouquets in Cambridge were funded by the flower arrangers, but was their motivation entirely selfless? They just like to do it really and be part of, be part of this. So really, I think the funding is secondary. Um, people are very flower arrangers are very generous. We have a saying: flowers, fr friendship, and fun. And I think that just about covers it. Really, we do have fun together, and. Um, uh, that, that's satisfaction and payment enough, really. The Lonely Bouquet Day is just one of the ways flower clubs across Cambridgeshire try to help people, and every year they choose different charities to support. This year I, I chose the Cystic Fibrosis um, charity because it's, you know, part of... I'm, I, I am a carrier, a gene carrier of cystic fibrosis. Um, we didn't know, obviously, with family um, until my niece had a little boy who was um, cystic fibrosis. Um, and it, it runs in a you know, family gene, one in 25 are carriers. And if two carriers get together, you've got 50% chance of, of having a cystic fibrosis child. So much goes on and everybody needs support, really. So it's just nice to be able to help because people don't realise sometimes that they can actually, you know, create these things and get such pleasure from it. For people like Kim and Sheila, flower arranging has helped them through difficult times in their lives and they hope that schemes like the Lonely Bouquet Day is just one of the ways they can help others. This is Katura Sestine for That's TV. Fire crews and police officers in Cambridgeshire are warning about the dangers of setting fires in disused buildings following a series of deliberate fires in Wisbeach. Chief Inspector Dave Murphy from Cambridgeshire Constabulary says that the police are increasing patrols in an effort to catch those responsible for the recent arsons. Anyone with information about who is responsible for the fires in Meadowgate Lane should contact police on 101. Teachers, social workers and professionals working with children and young people will descend on Newmarket Racecourse later this month. They will be attending Thrive's Forging New Connections conference, which aims to improve learning outcomes for children and young people across the east of England. The event will host a range of expert speakers on the topic. And a new cinema is set to open to the public in Ely on Friday. 
The six screen complex is part of the £15.7 million pound Ely Leisure Village. And while it hasn't yet officially opened, a special screening of King Arthur Legend of the Sword was shown on Wednesday. And we'd love to hear from you. If you've got a story you think should be on the show, email the details into news at thatscambridgetv.com or tweet your thoughts to at thatscamtv. Or you can find us on Facebook, just search for That's Cambridge. And of course, you can write to us as well. The address is That's Cambridge, 140 Cowley Road, Cambridge, CB4 0DL. On Thursday, the newly elected Mayor of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, James Palmer, held a press conference to outline what he plans to achieve in his first 100 days in office. Here's what he had to say. This report contains flash photography. Now joining me in the studio is our reporter Jeremy Wilson, who was at the press conference. What was it like in the room? It was very interesting. This type of press conference is not normal really for this part of the country um, to have like such a big show be put on. Um, the, he, he, James Palmer gave out um, his 32 point plan. I, I, you're not hearing that wrong, 32 points. Um, it was kind of thrust on the journalists, so much information to digest. It was almost like everyone was scrambling to work out what questions to ask. But there was one really clear question in the room from all the journalists who were there and they wanted to know how he as the new metro mayor was going to interact with the city deal. Um, he did say that um, he was going to work alongside the combined authority on particularly on transport issues to provide the best possible future for transport for Cambridge when he was pushed on this issue. Um, he did again say that there wasn't going to be any conflict between the two. But um, he, he, never, he didn't give any clear indication of when it comes to the lead on big issues, who was going to take charge, because clearly somebody needs to. And this gets very interesting on one of his points, which um, one of the 32 points, which is light rail and underground for Cambridge. Um, he says that he's going to have a feasibility study, um, presumably to see how much this, this is going to cost and, and whether um, he can go ahead with it. And why this is interesting is um, the, the city deal, which has a lot of money to deal with transport issues in, in Cambridge, this should be at the top of their agenda. It's something they said they're interested in, but, they're, but the length of time which it takes to do a project like this has meant that it keeps getting pushed to the back burner. And what we could be about to see is some sort of conflict, you could call it, I guess, between the two, some pushing back and forward over, over probably the biggest transport infrastructure project Cambridge has ever seen. Now, I did ask um, James Palmer whether he thought such a project um, was really de deliverable, and his answer should be coming up for you now. And it seems like there's a lot of strategies involved here. Yes, um, there's a, all sorts of um, planning and strategy issues going on on this 32-point uh, deal, 32-point uh, plan, and you can you can see what the the obvious criticism of this is. It's it's the easiest thing in the world to say. Well, I'm going to put together focus groups and feasibility studies and plans, but whether they actually become deliverable projects is another question. And I guess another question people will be asking as well is uh, the sort of the big criticism of, of this new mayoral role is whether it's just another layer of bureaucracy. And it does seem at the moment that, um, that whether it is or not hasn't been answered clearly. Well, that is all we have time for, but thank you very much for joining me, Jeremy. Thank you. As part of Dying Matters Awareness Week, people in Cambridge are hosting a death festival on Saturday, which is aimed at confronting death. Set up by the organisers of a cafe that offers a safe space to discuss death, this is the first event of its kind in the city, and I went to speak to some of those involved to find out why we should talk about this subject. Everyone will face death at some point in their lives, but for some, confronting this subject face on makes it a far less daunting process. What I know from organising the death cafes and, and now the festival is that there are actually a lot of people out there who really do want to talk about death. So 
it's not about forcing people who don't want to, but it's just about offering a space for people who do want to talk about it, where they can come along and talk. So that, to me, that feels really important. And, and for me personally, um, you know, I like remembering that I'm going to die because it has a, you know, it has, an, it has a real impact on how I live. And in fact, all of these things, the death cafes and the festival, although the subject is death and dying, what it's really about and what it always comes back to is life and living and how we're going to choose to live given that we're going to die one day. Penny feels it is important to offer this safe space as she believes death is viewed in a negative way. It's the way our society really sort of hides death away and kind of pretends, it's almost like we're pretending we're not going to die and I think it's it's really got worse in recent years, you know we when one, one someone from our family dies, the bodies are whipped away. We don't have them. We don't have open coffins. We don't have them in our front room. It's all funerals that were very formalised. You know, with our advances in medical care, people are kept alive for. Um, you know, it's it's almost like it's a failure to die. But how can talking about death actually help? I've found it really helpful to be able to talk about death because it used to be a scary unknown thing and I just had thoughts in my head going around um, and suddenly when you can talk about them and you can find out about you know people who've seen a, a relative die and that it can be peaceful and really reassuring and it's given them a lot of hope and, and not satisfaction but um, calm in their lives um, it makes it a much more um, Thing that something you can face, something you can talk about, something you can imagine happening without just fear. After losing people in her life, Sue believes visiting the death cafe helped her to overcome her fears. This all started, it, it sounds really quite silly, my cat died, but it's the first close bereavement I've had and it happened at the same time as the anniversary of my husband's um, father's death. Um, so it seemed a good time to just really start talking about it in a very open way and, and we both grieved quite differently but it helped us to be able to communicate. But it's not just about dealing with death itself. Talking about death may also help ease the process of planning a loved one's funeral. It's going to happen to all of us and I have so many conversations with families whereby they haven't communicated their funeral wishes so when somebody dies the poor family left behind are full of stress because they don't know what to do. Because a lot of the stress is taken away when the decisions have already been made by the person that's died. So it's so important to communicate um, what you want before you die. Uh, and it really does help the rest of the family, knowing, bringing them comfort that they've made the right decisions. The festival will feature speakers on different aspects of death, as well as art and photography work, skeleton exhibits and a live show. This is Kachira Sestine. For that's TV. A woman has died following a car accident in Elton. 82-year-old Josephine Booth was driving a green Nissan Micra when she was involved in a collision with a lorry on Thursday. She was airlifted to Addenbrooke's hospital but later died. Anyone who witnessed the collision is urged to call police on 101. And thousands of young people are turning to Childline to help cope with the pressure of exam stress. New figures released by the NSPCC revealed that it delivered over 3,000 counselling sessions on exam stress over the last year, an 11% increase from the past two years. And Arthur Rank Hospice's £10.6 million home scooped an award for Project of the Year at the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors 2017 East of England Awards, which took place on Wednesday. 36 of the region's most impressive and community beneficial property schemes battled it out and Cambridge's Arthur Rank Hospice was the winner of the Community Benefit category at the region's Property Oscars. And we'd love to hear from you. If you've got a story you think should be on the show, you can email the details into news at thatscambridgetv.com or tweet your thoughts to at thatscamtv. Or you can find us on Facebook, just search for That's Cambridge. And of course, you can write to us as well. The address is That's Cambridge, 140 Cowley Road, Cambridge, CB40DL. <laughs> Mr.
Many of us know the story of World War II, but imagine going to school and finding out that right next door is a hostel that once housed refugees from Germany. This is exactly what happened to some students at Parkside Community College, and after months of research and planning, they put on a show on Thursday to portray the lives of some of the refugees. I went along to speak to some of these students to find out more about the inspiration behind the project. Inspired by the lives of Spanish and German refugees, A Tale of Two Hostels is an exhibition and show portraying the history of those who came to Cambridge to seek refuge from the Nazis. The project, which was started in September last year, was carried out by a small group of students who all went through months of planning and research. It's so sad because it's so important for us to learn in Cambridge what actually is going on and uh, I go to school at Parkside and so right next door to us there's this there's 25 Parkside and I had no idea what the history behind that building was. The project was started by Mark Turner, head of history at Parkside Community College, who stressed the importance of getting children involved in Cambridge's past. One of the things we're finding is that keeping uh, this event alive, the understanding of the history of the Holocaust alive is a difficult job and as the years go by children seem to know less and less about this extremely important issue so it's, it's one of those conscious raising issues that we need to keep in the minds of our children. It's been extremely important obviously not just in terms of the project itself but what we can find out about local history and that's been part of it is to find out some of the hidden history of Cambridge but it's more as important what is as important I should say is watching the children work together as a group and to see how they develop and grow and mature through putting together what is a very complex uh, pro project. One of the refugees who resided at 25 Parkside was Gerald Weiner. He first came to Cambridge in 1944 and spent a short time here before moving to Oxford. Now, nearly 75 years later, Gerald has returned to Cambridge to see the project. These youngsters have really performed a wonderful job and it's good to know, it's really good to know that young people have been encouraged to delve into a history that could so easily be forgotten. It's wonderful that young people have uh, involved themselves in a project to do with refugees. Grateful for the opportunity to come to England, Gerald feels overwhelmed by the support he has received and the second chance he was given. Cambridge is quite nostalgic. I hadn't expected it to be. I, it's 73 years ago that I came here, you know, that's an age. It was in early 19, in January 1944, and I came to this hostel at 25 Parkside. Uh, the young people there were marvelous. The other, we were, we were real mates, all of us. I was here for only nine months, mind you, but uh, those were happy nine months. If I hadn't come to Britain, I would have been dead. <laughs> and this, was, this has become my country. I've been here now since 1939, early 1939. Uh, Cambridge was, of course, an inspiration. Stories like Gerald's have provided students at Parkside Community College with more knowledge and insight into Cambridge's history. I find the whole process exciting because it's new and it's different because you're doing something that people have never done before or at least you're learning things that are hidden from most people. It's extraordinary that we don't know about it, especially as I've grown up in Cambridge and I, I had no idea that these refugees had come and they stayed in a house right next to our school and stayed by Station Road and so I think it's really important to uncover the stories of like the refugees who came here in the war. The tale of two hostels has showcased never before seen footage as well as poems, readings, dances and accounts of the refugee children. This is Couture Assessing for That Cambridge. Let's take a quick look at the local sport now. 
The Cambridge University Women's Boat Club has elected Daphne Marchenko as their new president. The American rower takes over from Ashton Brown, who led the Light Blues to victory on the Tideway this year. Marchenko is a veteran of the boat race, taking part in both 2015 and 2016, and is studying for a PhD in education at Magdalen College. And 14-year-old former Coleridge Community College student Sam Chesterman has won his first national table tennis title. Partnered with Amaral Hussein, he defeated top seeds Ethan Walsh and Joe Cope in the final to claim the Cadet Boys doubles title. And time for a look at the local weather. There will be a few heavy showers this evening, but it will become dry overnight with some clear spells developing. Minimum temperatures of 10 degrees. The odd shower may develop throughout the day tomorrow, but it will become much lighter with warm and sunny spells, maximum temperature of 21 degrees. Early rain on Sunday will clear to sunshine with some scattered heavy showers, while Monday will stay mostly dry. And I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Thank you very much for watching, but from me and everybody else on the news team, it's goodbye for now.